Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, I'm here with my friend, Greg Witsit, who is the Planning Director for Adventist Mission here at the General Conference. Hello, Greg. Hi. And I actually can say we are friends because we, we have are. known each other since I was a teenager. Mercy. Yeah, it's been a while. I won't say how I'm long not that sure while that, is. I mean, come on. You could be like, that was just a short time ago. But you're like, that's been a while. It's, it's been, it has been yeah. a while. We <laughs> won't be say fair. how long, but it has been a while. Uh, 23 yeah. years? Has it? Yeah, it's been about 20, actually 90s. about 25 yeah. Been tw- about, oh, yeah. goodness. Wow. Yeah. That's okay. That was just a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Quarter century. Um, yeah. So you were my teacher. For and a brief period. Call Porter leader. Call Portering together. Yes. Yeah. We had fun. But even though we now go to church together, we work in the same building together. It's true. Um, our kids have been friends when they were in high school. And yet here we are. And I don't fully know that much about your life story. Hmm. So. We're going to sit here and we get to talk about it over our nice little mugs of water. Well, thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. I look forward to so, it. So I like to start the very early years, the very beginning. Um, but before I get to like, who is Greg Witsit and where was he born? Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about your, your family. My family. Um, I have multiple generations of church workers in the church, not just church members. Um, I lose track of how many generations, but it's five or six generations. Um, Publishing leaders on both my mom's side and my dad's side. My mom's father was worked for the Adventist Review, or excuse me, I should say it. It's the Review and Herald Publishing Association, and actually went over to uh, Kenya, working out of Kindu Bay in southwest Kenya as a missionary and as publishing director there. But, well, the press manager. And um, that was in the primarily in the 60s, if I remember right. And uh, my great-grandfather on my dad's side was the publishing director for the General Conference. Oh, wow. And um, he had actually gone out as a missionary way back in the 20s when my grandmother was two years old. And one of his assignments was to move the press that Jane Andrews had set up into France, where I think pretty much where the press is there now. So um, he. So J N N Andrews Press. Yeah, he had. I mean, that kind of feels that kind of feels very special. Like because yeah. we we kind of admire J N N Andrews. He's our first missionary. <laughs> yeah. You know, to be able to have that kind of connection, very cool. Yeah. So so I kind of grew up around a lot of this history. Interesting that it's printing on both sides. It's not call portering, which is what I did. Uh, they weren't call porters, but they were printers. And actually, after World War II, my great-grandfather was working here as a publishing director at the General Conference and helped to rebuild a lot of the presses that had been damaged during World War II from his leadership role at that time. So that's kind of something that we're proud of, I'm proud of, to have that um, in my background and then later was employed at the Review, which we could talk about that another we'll time. We'll get there. But, uh, <laughs> we'll get there. I'll get there. Okay. No, so. that is, it is very neat, though, because... I mean, the church has only been around for 150 years. Mm. Um, so to have this these generations going back and working in publishing ministries, mm. because publishing was the very first like way that we really kind of shared with the world. This was like our first media outreach kind of a thing. So your your family has always been at the cutting edge <laughs> of the technology of the day <laughs> um, to share the gospel. Mm-hmm. And so... This legacy has been passed on to you, and because I do know a little bit of your story, I know that it it must have been very impactful as you grew up. So let's talk about that. Where did you grow up? Where was Greg Witsit born? I can tell you where I was born, but it's it's a long story to say where I grew up because I was. I'm a sure we'll get kid. through there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go, we'll go to yeah. every single house. Do you remember every address? I don't remember the addresses. No. Okay. Well, but okay. I do remember. Many of the homes. Um, in fact, I have an easy time remembering my age when I my oldest memories based on where we lived. <laughs> I can just go back in the timeline and have that. Like, oh, that. I was in this house, so that was in that city. <laughs> exactly. Okay, I remember now. <laughs> so I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. My father was 
a elementary school teacher in the town of Jasper, which is, I don't know, 45 minutes or so west of Chattanooga, or at least of the college. So that was, and my mom was a nurse at that time. So I'm, I'm the second of three in my family. So I'm the second born. And then this 10 years later became the middle so one. so well, because I'm the middle child of three. I see. So this it's a special place. So much. It is. It's yeah. the best place. I mean. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, so when, by the time I was, uh, I was a toddler, my dad took a call to pastor in South Dakota. Did he always know he wanted to be a pastor? He actually intended, well, that's a good question. I know that he was studying theology at the time that he ended up going into education, but he was also studying history. He loves history. So all of our family vacations were always surrounding some trip to see something historical or a Sunday outing. Every We moved so often, so every time he, on Sundays we would say, okay, let's go out and see this. So we had all these road trips to historic places in the state we were living in. Yes, we moved around to many states. Okay, real quick. What was your favorite historic site that you remember going to visit? My favorite historic site. Doesn't matter what age, we, you know, we can, we can move back and forth here a little bit. I, it's a hard one, but I would say anything Revolutionary War in New England, um, I, lo- I, do, I, al- I did enjoy seeing the Mayflower, you know, the rebuilt ship that the Pilgrims came across on. So that was big, but I also enjoyed um, the whole um, Revolutionary War trail stuff you see in Boston and out to Concord and Lexington. So Massachusetts by far is my favorite state. And I grew up on Cape Cod for a number of those years. Okay. So Massachusetts has, and that's where I met and married. Well, I didn't marry, but courted my wife, Amy. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to get there because that's one of my favorite parts (laughs) of the story. Um, Okay. So um, your dad takes a call to Dakotas. Mm hmm. Which Dakota? He was South Dakota. And I was too young for me to piece it all together, but he had three different assignments, I believe. First, he worked as an intern pastor under his brother. Oh, that's fun. Who is seven years older than him, if I remember right. Um, so um, that happened, I think that was a year or two. But then he was pastoring other places and did a lot of evangelism. In fact, uh, one of the more contemporary evangelists in the church uh, that a lot of people know is Ralph Ringer. He's now semi-retired, but he led evangelism in the Southern Union for a long time. But he was somebody that my dad loved doing evangelism with. And they actually worked together in three or four conferences. Very cool. Yeah. So my early memories were sitting on the front pew of the church, my mom playing the organ, my dad preaching and uh, uh, going to evangelistic meetings, helping to stuff envelopes or, you know, all the stuff that you had to do uh, related to that. Even when I was very little, I remember having a role. South Dakota is in the northern part of the United States. So it's like in the middle part of America, for those Mm -hmm. who may be listening and don't know, and in like the north, where we get snow. Do you remember snow? Oh, I remember, yes. I remember that we would sled down the snow drift <laughs> that was piled up of all my dad's shoveling the driveway. It made a good sled hill because there was so much snow. Um, South Dakota has the extremes of very cold winters and very hot summers. Uh, so we get 100 degree weather plus. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. Oh, it's extreme. It's kind of like a, it reminds me of like what you'd expect in a desert where it can get really cold at night and very hot in the day. But it's this obviously not a desert, but it's <laughs> it's very much the extremes. And I remember my dad and mom having to go to a minister's meeting once. We stayed with a church member who had a farm. They, they, um, where the, they had corn, they had sheep and different things. So it was, I enjoyed South Dakota, even though I was so little, I only have a few memories. Hmm. All right. So where did we go after South Dakota? West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah. So I went to first grade in West Virginia. Um, where in West Virginia were you? Clarksburg. Okay. Yeah. So not too far from here. Um, I don't know how long that is, but it's, Clarksburg was the town and I had a teacher my first grade teacher was Anna Hill. 
And she grew up in New York City. And I remember thinking, that is so cool. <laughs> this one, she talked about riding the subways. And I'm like, she's this little tiny petite woman that probably was very close to retirement age. I mean, she, she was. And, um, but she was really special because she, it was a multi-grade classroom. So this means that you're most likely an Adventist education. Adventist education. Okay, Thank I was you. just going to say, I'm, good. I'm just, when she said the multi-grade, that kind of tends to be the giveaway. <laughs> so I have gone through only Adventist education. Okay, well then we Nothing just covered else. that and I now know That's moving it. forward it's always going to be Adventist. Everything is Adventist, okay. that's right. So tell me about Anna. About what? The, your teacher. Oh, Anna Hill. Yes. Okay, so she was a special person. She was a no-nonsense lady. But she didn't have to raise her voice to let you know that she was in charge. She was as quiet as you could imagine, um, but just kind of solid personality. And she saw in me someone that quickly learned my lesson, and she would assign me to help a kindergartner to do some basic math and this and that while she's teaching the fifth graders or someone else. So she would actually involve the students in helping each other. But one of the, one of two memories, well, there's three memories that are really interesting with this. We can go with all three. All three. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, The first one is nap time. Oh, (laughs) I hated nap time. We had a forced nap time after lunch and she would read to us and then we'd have to have just quiet. And I think that was her time for sanity, you know, for herself to do, <laughs> take care of herself. Bad time to get a drink of but water. She was all, <laughs> right. But she was always very, very composed, so she never came across as, like, stressed out. Um, but the other thing was um, she had a new memory verse for us to learn every week. And the very first memory verse I remember learning from her was Ephesians 4.32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, uh, God in Christ forgave you. And so uh, your first grade. That was my first grade and one of my first memory verses. And I remember it till now. Um, so I really like that practice. Um, the other thing is we would play sports in the small little fellowship hall in the basement of this old church. And I remember how silly that was. And my parents moved during my second grade year. I imagine that little room with no outdoor playground or anything, it would have gotten old and I would have gotten restless. But as a first grader, it was a great way to start off my academic career. I really <laughs> love Miss, Miss Hill. She was an amazing woman. And she walked, she never had a driver's license. She walked to school. She lived in an apartment across uh, the busy road. So quite a memory. Wow. All yeah. right. Um I love it. Having grown up in a multi-grade mm. school myself, most of those things resonated with me. We did have a big field, though, that we could do sports in. We never had to do it in a small basement. Yeah. So that would be interesting. So where did you guys go from here? Well, um, I think we were only in West Virginia about four years. Um, and my father had a call to go to Massachusetts, Cape Cod which is surrounded by water and loved it. In in fact, enjoyed the off season. Tourists were always there in the summer. It was busy, but the fall and spring and the winter was great. There was a church and still is um, right there in in, uh, Centerville. Um, And then there was a church on Martha's Vineyard. And we would go to that twice a month in good, in the, warmer seasons and then in the cooler seasons once a month so that was a neat a neat thing we would go out on the ship uh south afternoon for this other church service now i understand that that church that group is no longer there the members so to get to the church you actually had to get on a boat on a ferry yes okay well that's fun seven miles out into the ocean which doesn't sound like much but on a old ferry with trucks and cars you know it'd take 45 minutes to an hour to get there i don't think i actually knew that martha's vineyard was was not on massachusetts proper yeah oh yeah learned something new today thank you (laughs) (laughs) so then from there we went to tennessee where i went to high school okay so let's let's talk a little bit about your elementary years because these are kind of like formative years in a kid's life yeah so you were in Adventist education. Mm-hmm. Um, 
were you involved in like Pathfinders and those kind of things as well? Yeah, I sure was. Um, Pre-Pathfinders and then Pathfinders. They didn't call it Adventures in those days. Um, so they were pre-Pathfinders. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I remember all of that. It was a two, in, on Cape Cod, it was two classrooms. When we first arrived. We upgraded. Like we yeah, doubled the classroom Two rooms. Space. And it was, felt so big. You know, I was like, <laughs> wow, this is a big school. Um, and it was a husband-wife team. Um, Kevin and Sherry Wall. And uh, Kevin just retired a few years ago. They were young teachers at the time and really enjoyed their teaching. Um, and there were other teachers because Sherry had her first child. And, of course, she wanted to focus on raising her own kids. So she stepped out and other teachers came in. But those were great years. Um, uh, Kevin took us out to learn how to play ice hockey, learn to skate, ice skate, um, played floor hockey in the basement of the Love church. Um, he made a, we had woods behind the church and he um, actually um, made a trail out in the woods and played trail tag where it was hide and seek, but oh, in that the woods. Sounds like fun. So he, he was pretty creative with the things he'd have us do, but enjoyed it a lot. So the church has created, and we have a huge education system. Mm -hmm. um, we've created pathfinders. These are always to kind of connect our young people to their faith. Yeah. Would you say during these early years that those did that for you? Uh, absolutely. Um, what, what I think Adventist Education and Pathfinders did for me was to explore the world and all kinds of disciplines, you could call it, um, but things. with a worldview... <laughs> that of of the great controversy you know that god created this world that the world's in rebellion but god has a solution and that we live in this time when when we have to choose sides but everything we studied was within that worldview even if you know there was no bible study during science or math or whatever but it just you know it i think without the Adventist education um you know a lot i wouldn't have i think I think it even gives so much more. A lot of people don't have the option, and so homeschool is better for them. But um, without a question, I think even homeschoolers miss out on something because of the fact that you're learning through others in the church, not just through your own parents. Um, there's nothing against homeschooling. I know a lot of people do that. We did that with our own kids because we were working overseas uh, when they were young. But uh, Avis education is such a blessing, especially counterintuitively, especially the little one or two room schools. I think that those are underrated. People don't realize. I, and I've, I've talked with people when I was living in Asia that the idea of having a multi-grade classroom just seemed like it would be such a low quality school education program. And actually it's not because you're learning, you, you have multiple ages in the group. You're overhearing lessons for another group, but you're also learning to focus while they're being taught. And it's a totally different atmosphere. Um, but I actually, I love that because I also did single room classrooms yeah. too later. But So you did talk about though, um, and I, I shared my story on my podcast and I also talked about yeah. why. And we also get to help others. That's right. So we, so we have our learning reinforced so, you know, a lot of times when kids come to school late, you know, the next year, it's like they have to kind of remember it because we're kind of overhearing what's coming next and we're being able to support others. We're always being able to get this like reinforcement of what's in the past, a preview of the future while being solidified in the present. Yeah. Um, and it, it is a gift that yeah. I think is very misunderstood. And we underestimate the, I think when we basically pigeonhole education to be about academics and getting information only that we don't really understand education. Education is so much more. It's about building the character, building a life. So having more of those different age groups together and different experiences like that, I think you're actually doing a lot more to build a character than if it's just about academics. I love it. Yeah. So you end up in Tennessee during yeah. your high school years. So I have to ask, I ask this of everybody, mm -hmm. um, 
high school years can be particularly difficult because Mm -hmm. now we are grappling with who we are, our very core identity Mm -hmm. as people. Did you ever, I mean, you had this beautiful legacy of people who worked in the church and um, (laughs) did you ever struggle with your faith? That's a good question. Um, To answer that, I have to back up a little bit. You can back as far back as you need to. Uh, My mother really made family worship a priority. And not only that, but she also made, um, she also made it a priority to teach us to ask for forgiveness when we had hurt someone, when we had disobeyed. And I remember to this day, the night I would not ask for forgiveness from my father for having done something. I don't remember what it was, <laughs> but I just remember, remember that wrestling at the time, I think I was 11, maybe 12 at the oldest, but I think I was 11. Um, and just, to, I had to confess something to him. I confessed to my mom. She's, oh, your dad will hear you. No, it's fine. And in my childhood mind, you know, a child mind, I didn't think that parents talk, you know, they, they, my dad already <laughs> knew probably. But to actually come out and tell my dad, I'm sorry, this is what happened. I was so embarrassed I didn't do it. And I actually remember that being a turning point in my life where I wasn't as close to God, that there was something interesting not in sorts in my life. Um, so that actual like distance between you and your father kind of start, I mean, not distance, but like a little bit of an offness there also created that offness with kind of like the heavenly father. Slightly. Yeah. It, it was, I mean, just like in a slight way. It, I'd never associated it as impacting my relationship with my dad so much as I, I marked that as... I'm not at peace hmm. with myself. There's something wrong. And that continued um, for a season of my life until college. So when you ask about my high school years, that's kind of like this bookmarked period of my life where yeah, I, I wasn't any longer a simple child in my, in, in my relationship with God. Um, when we moved to, when we moved to Tennessee, it was to Nashville. Um, I was going into the seventh grade, so I wasn't done with elementary school, but I thought I was going to the the capital of country, (laughs) you know, not country country music only, but country like cowboys and, you know, people wearing cowboy boots and chewing on, you know, alfalfa and who knows what else, you know. <laughs> I That was my, because, you know, here I was on Cape Cod. It was very different. I'm Now we're going to You're Tennessee. Going so south. I know. Yeah, we're going <laughs> south. So this is going to be interesting. And I tell you, my classmates hated country music, whereas friends up in, in Massachusetts love country music. The, to them, it was so not cool. Uh, this is during the 80s, of course, when pop, you know, was everything. Um, and I struggled to make friends. I was not accepted in to the elementary school and then I ended up going there was two big multi-grade multi-classroom you know eight classrooms for eighth grades there's two different schools um one um was at the elementary school at Madison Academy you know the campus there and the other one was across town which is actually the school I should have been going to so my eighth grade year I switched and I chose I'm going to be I'm going to be a lot less timid I'm going to try to make friends better and I did, but we also had only, you know, 12 people in the classroom, and it was very small, and it was two grades per classroom, so it was a little bit more multi-grade. It was easier to fit in there. But throughout my high school years, I felt like I was on the outside looking in. You know, it was very hard for Where a teenager. Where did you go? I went to Madison Academy. Okay. Excellent teachers, good students, good... It's, it's not... I, I When I look back on it, I realize it's not that they were bad kids that wouldn't let me in. It's just the environment is it's hard for a teenager to feel at home in in a place where teenagers are all about fitting in. You know, every teenager is trying to do the same thing, trying to stay cool, trying to fit in, and they don't realize that they're actually treating others very unkindly while they're trying to fit in too. You know, so it's, I don't, there are times you have bullies and that sort of thing. And there were always one or two of those uh, in those different, in the the two schools that I struggled with. But the average person, it wasn't their fault. It was just, but it was hard. So I focused on academics and um, 
also auto mechanics and work. I loved working. I tried to work as much as I could. What did you do? Um, at first, I worked in the commercial laundry that's still there to this day, um, doing laundry for all the hospitals and nursing homes in Nashville, or a lot of them. And then after that, um, I took an auto mechanics class, auto, you know, what do you call it? Car care, you know, just a big basic. <laughs> and I loved it. And so I asked, and they gave me a job at the mechanic shop. They actually had a commercial shop for fixing cars, and they hired me on as basically a cleaner and helping with some light mechanical work. I really enjoyed that job. And to this day, I like to do my own repairs. So in high school, we often start having to explore, what do I want to be when I grow up? Yes, ma'am. Because after high school graduation, we go to college and we have to pick a major. And <laughs> once you start paying for that major, you really don't want to shift it around mm. too much. Yeah. When you were in high school, what did you want to be? I wanted to go into psychiatry. I can totally see you as a psychiatrist. Really? Yes. Yeah. I can I can actually see it. Even your glasses right now. You have a whole psychiatrist <laughs> psychiatry. look going on right now. <laughs> no, I really like counseling. I like interacting with people deeply. Um, but part of the reason why I wanted to do that is my best friend, Matt, Matt Dodd. Uh, his parents went through a divorce. And... I thought, and, and also in seventh grade, so that happened, I was probably ninth grade or so, I don't remember. Um, but in seventh grade, we had uh, tapes we would listen to uh, from Focus on the Family, okay. James Do Dr. James Dobson. And I thought, you know what, the Adventist Church needs a good psychiatrist who can do family psychology and do this kind of a thing. I thought I would really like to do that because I realized even though we have lots of good Adventists, we still have family issues. We still have internal things that we struggle with. And I thought, ah, that's what I'd like to do. Um, my father, I remember we were pulling up after I had worked. He picked me up and bring me home after school and work. We stopped at a traffic light in Goodlettsville, Tennessee, and he said, Greg, I was talking about all the things I was interested in. Uh, at one time, it was architecture, and then it went to psychiatry. And he said, I think you'd make a good pastor. Have you ever thought about that? And I said, yeah, but no, I'm not interested. And he says, well, why not? And I thought about it for a moment, and I thought, this isn't going to sound good. But I said, Dad, to be a pastor, you need to have a burden for souls, and I don't. And I, my dad's never told me, I don't know if he remembers the conversation, but he's never told me how he reacted to that. But if I was the father, I would have been like, <laughs> you know, I fell. <laughs> like, What's going on? <laughs> you know, I was involved in the evangelistic meetings, you know, I, very, you know, good kid. I was not a, re a rebellious did right kid. Things. I did all the right things, but I just didn't have a burden for soul winning, I had a burden for people, but not for leading them to Christ. Um, and so my parents moved again as a pastor to northern New England, uh, New Hampshire. And um, that was in the middle of my junior year. So I had to decide what am I going to do? What school am I going to go to? This Madison Academy was not a uh, boarding school, so I have to move schools. So, um, but I looked at the academy in Northern New England, and it did not have a college preparatory diploma. And I was doing all these advanced sciences and maths and stuff, and it's like, I'm not going to have anything to study there so that I wanted. So you go? Now I'm really curious. I don't know where you went. So what I did, my dad said, I said, well, can I just go there to finish my junior year, and then I'll take my GD and go to college? And he said, no, oh. you need to finish up the, the rest of your junior year and then your senior year. Or take your GED now. And I think he was thinking, hoping <laughs> that I would go to school, but I didn't. I said, okay. So I went and took my GED. <laughs> so yeah. what grade were you in? So the Ju general education diploma test in New Hampshire, you didn't have to be, you know, over the age of 25 or something to get it. You, you could get it even if you were high school age. So I just did that and dropped out of school. I did not know that. That's what I did. Yeah, I, I don't think my parents had wanted me to do that, but that's what I did. Yeah, so this is a warning to parents. <laughs> Be careful what you throw out at your kids because they're going to choose the option you didn't think that they were going right. to choose. And then you have to live with it because you yeah. gave them the option. But I had goals. And so um, I worked for the rest of that 
year, and then I went to Atlantic Union College to study nursing. As my pre-med degree, I was going to do pre-med and nursing and then go on to Loma Linda to do psychiatry. psychiatry. That was my goal. All right. So Atlantic Union College is in Massachusetts. We come back to Massachusetts. Yeah. A lot of your story kind of keeps coming back to Massachusetts. It was a hub. Doesn't yes. It? Yeah, it's your little hub. Yeah. Your, your life hub. My life hub. Yeah. So you're at Atlantic Union College. And I know that there is a woman who enters the picture. Mm. Yes. Well, we're at AUC. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about Amy. You can tell us a little bit because if people really want to hear Amy's story, she has actually shared. So they need to go find her and a profile. <laughs> we might actually link it okay. below That's this. A good and we'll idea. link both of yours okay. so that people can find. That's a great idea. And they can compare stories this way. <laughs> so when I met Amy, I was no longer a nursing student. So maybe I should tell that before okay. I talk let's, about Amy. Let's tell, because... the, let's tell the story. So I got to Atlantic Union College, got enrolled in nursing, and um, I enjoyed it. But I enjoyed the study of it more than the practice of it. But I still, I was very involved in, in doing it. And um, But then I got involved in the student association or the student government, in some, some schools call it. And um, I was a campus ministries director. I say A. I ran as a campus ministries director with another student. And I did it for two years. So I was leading. Campus ministries includes like the student um, week of prayer included Sabbath afternoon activities, Friday evening activities after Vespers. Uh, things that maybe future pastors would do. Outreach activities. Yeah. So <laughs> I here saw I'm the doing rolling of the eyes over there. <laughs> so I'm doing all of this as a nursing student and I realized this is more fun than what I'm doing going into clinical. Now I did enjoy psychiatric nursing. Most of my classmates hated psychiatric nursing, but I loved it. Um, there's this one woman who hadn't spoken since she'd been admitted and that had been about four days earlier. And they said, well you're assigned to this but don't expect much fun today because she's not talking. I said, well, my goal is to get her talking. They're like, good luck with that. And I sat with her for about seven hours, and she finally started talking, and I loved it. It was wonderful. This guy will not leave until I talk. (laughs) Well, I told her that. I said, I'm not leaving until you talk. (laughs) So I'm just here, and that's fine. We can be quiet, but I just want you to know that I'm a Christian. God cares for you. He knows where you're at. And I, these doctors and nurses are just trying to help you. Um, but I'm a student nurse, and I'm just here to support you in any way I can. I'll bring your meds in when it's time. But otherwise, I'm here. And there was no cell phones to check on, you know, or computers to look at. So you I was literally just there. Just there. <laughs> and it was, it, it took several hours before she started talking, but she did. And opened up. She had some tears. She had some things she wanted to share. I don't remember what they were now, but I just love that. All my classmates didn't like psychiatric nursing too much. But with the campus ministries experience, I said, you know what? I do enjoy ministry. And at the same time I was doing that, a friend, a pastor I knew, um, Tim Bailey, mm-hmm. came as the new Cole Porter leader for students in the Atlantic Union. And he saw me, he said, hey, can you help me recruit students? I said, oh, sure, I'll help you. I'll help you recruit. You're a campus ministries leader, so you're the one who can help me. And I realized here I was serving food in the cafeteria. I'm a campus ministries leader. I could make money doing ministry. Obviously, serving food is a ministry, but, you know, I was thinking I could. So I, so when he asked me, which it only took a few hours for him to ask, before he did (laughs) ask me, would you consider coming? I said, yeah, okay. And I loved it. Had so many experiences. Uh, Sold a great controversy to a a lawyer who was on Good Morning America the next morning. Um, she was commenting on the Rodney King case uh, the, and the the riots in Los Angeles. Um, sold another book to somebody who who felt that I had shown up at the very moment they needed the books. And just repeated experiences, and I realized, wow, there's something about recognizing that God is, do, is through his power, setting us up to meet people. Um, That was something I'd never really experienced. God had always been the one who protects you, who you pray to, um, but to actually be a part of ministry with him where he's performing miracles, that was new. And I started to form a burden for souls. And so my goal, I, I dropped out of nursing, 
um, and I went into a personal ministries. It's a Bible work degree, four-year degree. Um, basically the same as theology, but instead of the biblical languages, you did a Bible work training. Loved it. So my goal was to be a lifelong literature evangelist <laughs> <laughs> as a leader. I as remember a leader. us being encouraged yes, by our ma'am. leaders. <laughs> that was one of those to who do encouraged. The same yes. thing. <laughs> but... Um, so then I was leading, a couple years later, I was, ended up leading the team there on campus. And um, it was very interesting, Alyssa. Every single one of my students was a girl. There were no men in my group. <laughs> and uh, looking back on it, it's quite hilarious, actually. You know, I was totally clueless as to why are all these young women joining and no young men, but that's all we could rec- I could recruit. <laughs> <laughs> But I would recruit, I, I would give these little incentives. In fact, your sister, who was also an Amy, just like my wife is an Amy, um, was the one who recruited my future wife to come and join the team. You're welcome. Helper. Yes, thank just, you. Just, I mean, on behalf of my sister, our family says you're welcome. It's wonderful. Your family has been so good to, uh, to me. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's how I met Amy. And she quickly began selling circles around me. So I said, well, if you can't beat her, join her. So I proposed. It didn't <laughs> quite it didn't quite go like that. <laughs> it was just like, oh, she sells some i I'll just I'll marry her. And right. she says, yeah. yeah. What I what what drew my heart to Amy is her sense of humor and just chill personality. She is very she does not get ruffled. And she likes to laugh, and uh, she's very relaxed, and it just I like that. It was my of sister, course she was spiritual and all those things. My too. sister met her husband. You met your, and we end up creating this little Cole Porter family. Yeah, from that it sounds like. So you and act- we got married. Your sister and and Amy and I got married the same year in 1996. That is true. Just you guys were at each other's weddings. A few weeks apart from each other. Yeah. yeah. I remember that. Um, so you then decide to take on becoming a, what would you call GKI? What was your role at GKI? Okay, GKI, also known as George King, King Institute. Institute. George King being the first literature evangelist in the Adventist Church, um, or at least the one who made it popular yeah. um, as a career. Um that there was one already at the old farmhouse in Hagerstown. At the Review and Herald. At the Review and Herald Publishing Which Association. Which makes sense. It's a publishing thing called Porter's Publishing House. That's right. It's a beautiful marriage. At the time, uh, Ted Wilson was the president and uh, Dick Thomas was the um, director for publishing work for the Atlantic and Columbia Unions. And under him was Tim Bailey. He's now president in the Mountain View Conference in West Virginia, but he was my boss and he hired me after college. Um, and I worked for three years or so doing that with that. But the second year, I think it was, um, they said, well, we want a branch school in the Atlantic Union. So we have one in both unions. Um, I'd actually advised against it. I said, I think we're stretching a little thin here to try to run two schools, but it was it was tried for a semester and then we and agreed that it was a little met. too stretched. That's where we met. One of the six students. Yes, yeah. that was a great experience. <laughs> it was an experiment. It's it's really interesting <laughs> because when you're pioneering something new like that, you know, it, it was young people leading young people. So I was as green and young as you were. Maybe I've had a couple more years on you, but um, I still trying to figure things Cole out. Remember my Porter leader because I had actually worked as a summer as a leader at this point. Okay, um, between my Senior year in high school. Where did you do freshman that? Year, and I was West Virginia. Oh, there you actually. go. You know, because I mean, we're just going to like pull yeah. all these things together. And you're from New York State. I'm from I'm from New York State. Yeah. And so I liked the idea of Massachusetts because it was kind of more in my you know area. Mm-hmm. And I was serving as the leader for student literature work in the Atlantic Union, yeah. so included New York and New England. So we and Bermuda. Yeah, and Bermuda. That yeah, one was Bermuda. more fun, yeah. probably. Yeah. And I. It was an experience there because my culprit, a leader, actually had never led before. 
And so he would oh, actually really? let me out last so I could explain to him which streets to put him on because I'm this 19 year old and he's the adult. Oh. But he was like, so I was teaching him how to be a call porter leader. But I still remember your wife teaching me um, anatomy and physiology. Yes. So we had fun though. We had a lot of fun. But it closed after one semester. And and just for those who don't know, this school, we were actually tutoring classes that were offered through Griggs University at the time. Now the now obviously operated under Avenus, uh, Andrews University. Yeah. So, so it was, was accredited. accredited with, I was like, with, it was accredited. Yeah. <laughs> but it was supposed to be homeschool, but was used to actually so that we could offer this as a as a degree. So it was a lot of fun. So where do you go from here? Because all of a sudden the school that they had kind of envisioned Think, doesn't happen. Yeah, I'm not going to get into a lot of details. Yeah, what we don't all need happened, to talk about that. <laughs> but um, after doing kind of leading student work in the Atlantic Union for from 96 until 99, um, Amy got pregnant with our first son, Tyler. And I got to thinking. I'm doing a little calculus here. You know what? We live on the road six to nine months of the year. How's that going to work with an infant? That's not going to be easy. And I realized there's, I would love to go to seminary. And I walked into Elder Wilson's office and I said, listen, they wanted me to stay on and take more leadership role. And um, I said, I've got a young one on the way. I'd like to go to seminary. I don't want to leave the work in, without a worker. Um, and, and actually Ted Wilson quickly just said, if I was your father, I'd say, go to seminary. He said, we'll, we'll figure out something with the work and it. And it did t require them to have to now do a new search and it did take some time. Um, but I'd made that announcement in January. So I remember. it was, it was quite a transition, but it was a God thing. And so we went to seminary in June. Tyler was born in July and I remember praying, my wife has a special calling for ministry. And Amy had made it very clear. In fact, our, our wedding was a dedication to team ministry. That was the theme of, our, of the message that uh, Pastor Merlin Knowles and his wife Cheryl had made that. They actually did the wedding together uh, for us. It was very special. Um, so that was our focus. And, but my wife was like, I'm not a traditional pastor's wife that plays the organ and arranges potlucks and this sort of thing. She wants to be involved in soul winning and outreach and this sort of thing. And so while I was at seminary and Amy was working with a hospice um, place, she's a nurse, so she was doing hospice there. Um, I was praying a lot and I was in a small group of other seminarians and we would pray for each other. And um, I was impressed with the idea that my wife has always wanted to be a missionary and at this point I knew I was just about soul winning and I wanted to do church planting I wanted to try that and I said well why not combine the two shouldn't missionaries be able to do that and so that's what we did we applied to the general conference um, there weren't any calls at that time it's a new day because now there are calls for those who want to go church planting overseas but at that time vividfaith.com vividfaith.com that's Just, right. You know, there's our plug. The whole mission refocus <laughs> is saying we need missionaries on the front lines, not just in support or administrative roles. But at that time, there was no calls for church planners. So then I applied to Avenue's Frontier Mission, and we found ways to, we ended up going overseas with them as a church planter after I graduated from seminary. So that was quite an adventure. What was the first country you went to? First country was Laos. Okay. So, from our entire story that we have gathered is you've lived in Massachusetts multiple times. You kind of mm. keep coming back there. You've been in West Virginia, Dakota, Tennessee. You don't seem like you have a lot of experience abroad. No, even <laughs> though I had missionaries on both sides of family, um, uh, my mom's and my dad's side, I had never been overseas except for on a mission trip. Okay, um, so you're so you're definitely that was suited. It. I went on a mission go, trip once. <laughs> went on one mission trip. You definitely are ready to go oh overseas. Oh, my. Yeah, that one experience. Tell me, <laughs> what is it like to bring a wife and small children to a country that is not a primarily Christian nation? 
and not have like, I mean, I know that there is some training and stuff like that, but what is it like to all of a sudden plunk yourself down and just exist? Well, I nearly died the first month we were there. So it was a shock to the system, to say the least. Um, within a couple of days of arriving in Thailand, the plan was to go to Laos, but I would need to go as a tent maker because of the visa situation. Laos is a communist country. What is country. a tent maker for those that don't know? So a tent maker is someone who, like the Apostle Paul, did not just receive funding to do the mission work, but actually would sew tents. And that would be a source of income to so him. So you were going to go and sew tents. So the idea was is that we would find employment uh, through an English language center or a college or something and, and um, do that and then also, um, you know, be a part. There was a small Adventist church there. No ordained pastors in the country. I think there was about 500 Adventists in the country at the time. But we were there to support the, the church and to help it grow and to plant new churches. So that was the goal. And um, But when we first went to Thailand, um, and then the, our host, who was going to take us to Laos and help us network, who knew the language, said, um, I, I'm finished up evangelistic meetings up here in this Mian Hill tribe up in the mountains. Come with me for the last week, and you'll learn some Thai language while you're here, which is similar to Lao, and then we'll go together. Great. Okay, we did that. I did that. Um, I ended up getting leptospirosis, amoebic dysentery, and dengue shock all at once. I have no idea what any of them are, <laughs> but it doesn't sound like it was probably pleasant. I, well, the infections went septic. Uh, kidneys shut down. I was in ICU for a week. It was really bad. So you've just brought your wife and small children over? I just, yeah. My children, Tyler at this point was three, and Ryan was five months old. So you have a wife, a three-year-old, and a five-month-old, and she's observing her husband going septic. Yes. And as a hospice nurse, she told me later, she said, when I went in there, I could smell that the, that, that, smell. that smell of what happens when your organs shut down. And she told her, our host, if Greg doesn't make it, I'm going to have to go back to America. But God has called me, so I will come back. So it was a real <laughs> test of her commitment. So you do get better, obviously, because you're sitting here. I'm here. <laughs> <That's so laughs> yeah. um, but I was weak for a while. Um, dealt with a lot of culture shock. It was weak. One of the side effects of dengue is you can get depression. So that was very hard, dealing with culture shock and all the news and everything. But um, God got us through it. And um, obviously, I found a job at a college, actually, in, in Laos. And um, had great experience there. Oftentimes, near-death experiences, mm -hmm. um, they trigger something for us. Um, maybe it makes you more, like, excited to pursue something. Maybe, you know, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Did your experience, did it tweak anything in your mind or in your heart? Like, I mean, you could have been like, I'm not doing this. I'm getting out of here and mm -hmm. brought your, your family back to America. What did that experience do for you? Um, Amy and I had prayed through very specific prayers to make sure that we weren't just in love with adventure and that mission was just an adventure. So we actually asked God to confirm our calling, and he did in so many ways, and I'm not going to go into all those ways, but everything to do with money and people's blessings for us to go and all of this that I was not expecting, even an employer telling us, you need to go because we were sponsored to seminary in the New York conference. When they heard our story and our sense of calling, they said, we support you, you go. Don't, we, we see God's calling. So all of that, and, and one of the things we prayed about, Lord, we want those signs because if our infant and toddler children were to get sick and die, we didn't want to feel like, oh, have we just pursued our pleasure, our a sense of adventure, or did God really call? So we'd prayed through that. Um, but I never stopped to think that something could happen to me. And I remember bargaining with God as I was in the on, in ICU. Uh, they couldn't get blood pressure, so they had me hooked up to EKG because my system was so weak. And um, they said, uh, Greg, uh, or I, I prayed. I said, Lord, um, it's clear you called us, but how can I be a missionary if I'm dead? It just mm. makes it make any sense. Of course, we've read missionary stories of people who 
could not survive but a few weeks and they'd pass away when they hit the mission field. So it's like, but how does that help anything? And um, I just realized I'm exactly where God wants me. Hmm. That's so hard in the midst of what was probably one of the scariest things in Amy's life. It, I think it was scary for her. It was just puzzling to me. But it brought me full swing back to that experience when I was a child where I had that complete peace. And then I remembered that moment when uh, when, when that experience wasn't there because I wasn't able to just keep a... Um, to keep my ex relationship with God simple. You know, keep it simple. When you do wrong, confess to who that person is and to God, and then not feeling like I could do that. But then here I was in the ICU, and I realized, you know what? There's, I know I'm, I'm totally at peace. There's nothing I have done that is against God's will here. Um, and so I just trusted that whatever happened, God would provide, and of course he did. But we have to, we have to keep these moments in our mind as little Ebenezers, that these are points in our life where um, we see that God has led us and where am, am I still in that same condition in my relationship with God, in my relationship hmm. with other people? You know, I, as you're talking, and you'll, you'll appreciate this as having been my call porter leader, um, there is a, a quote that we memorized from mm. call porter ministry. And it literally just all the words of it just came back. Difficulties will arise that will try your faith and patience, mm. but face them bravely and look on the bright side. And if the work is hindered, be sure it is not your fault and then go forward rejoicing in the Lord. Amen. You lived that. Difficulties were arising. Things just felt whatever. And you sought to find the peace in the Lord mm. and you went forward yeah. and you continued in missionary service. You did end up making it to Laos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How many years were you in Laos? 10 years. And I was... lived in Laos longer than I'd lived anywhere else in my life up to that point. And even till now. <laughs> so. How long have you been? Actually, no, I know exactly how long you've been here because we got here around we the came same at time. The same time. <laughs> so what was your primary role that you did in Laos? I'm sure there was lots of them because you were there for 10 years, but. Yeah. Um, we, the, the union asked us to start an English language center um, because they did had so few human resources in the country, but the church did enjoy legal status in the government. Even though it was a communist government, they had a legal registered status, and they wanted to raise up workers and pastors and so forth. So with their prompting, we did set up a school. We were also working with the church and supporting and mentoring uh, lay people and pastors in their ministries, in church planning, um, and different activities. So it was very rewarding. And while we were there, we also picked up a foster daughter who is now a nursing student in, in Bangkok, in the Adventist University there. Uh, she was offered a sponsorship to get her master's, either from Loma Linda or Samyuk, but she wants to go back to Laos. That would require her to stay in Bangkok. So she's like, no, I'm, I want to go back. So she turned that down. But um, And what is her name? Sita. Sita. Since we've already said Tyler and yeah. Ryan, I figured we should Right, and she's right between our son's ages. Okay. Um, and now, How uh, did you end up with Sita in your life? Oh, well, her mother worked for us as a as a janitor in the school and she'd gone through some difficult challenges in her life and um, she asked us to help her raise her daughter her mother loves her dearly but wanted some extra help so we've been helping her since she was nine or ten years old and uh, she lived with us for a few years when we w when we took the call to work with Adventist Mission to lead the Center for East Asian Religions um, we moved to Thailand, and, and she came and lived with us there, and that's where she started learning English. She learned a few words with us in Laos, but it wasn't really until coming to school in Thailand, complete immersion into English classes, that she picked up the language. So, so you're working for Adventist Frontier Missions at this point, right, in Laos? Until Thailand, yes. Okay, so how did you get a call to work for Adventist Mission? Well... That's a good question. Um, 
Rick McEdward contacted me and said he would like my resume so that that could be included in the names of people that they're considering as the new director for the Center of East Asian Religions. And after saying no a couple of times, um, I finally sent it in because I was not interested in positions uh, like that. I was enjoying what we were doing in Laos and our work there. But um, um, he then interviewed me. He said, are you willing? I know you're reluctant to change anything, but are you open to it or at least willing to pray about it? I said, oh, of course, we're willing to pray about it. And a few weeks later, they said, well, the committee chose you. And I felt rebuked because I hadn't prayed <laughs> and I did not want to <laughs> take the call. <laughs> I'm not going to pray about this because I don't want the answer to be yes. <laughs> Right. So then I was like, oh, I was, I was hoping they would forget. And <laughs> <laughs> You were hoping they were just going to casually forget you. Yeah, because there's other good names. And we're not Asian. Why not have an Asian do this? And and um, very humbled by it. And of course, once they called us, then we had to go through the process of praying about it and thinking about it. And, and over the next couple of weeks, we actually did feel clearly that God was calling. Um, but it was a hard transition. We we, let, we ripped our hearts out leaving Laos. It was it's even now our some of our closest friends are still there, but uh, we were so blessed and honored to to take that, and we did that in Thailand for six years, traveling. I say we because Amy became an associate director as a surprise. We didn't know that that would happen. Uh, several years into our time, ten years that we I was doing that role. Now at this point. Your sons are becoming teenagers. Yes, ma'am. And if I remember the story correctly, at some point they decide to come to America. Yes. And now our family is separated. Mm-hmm. Which is challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, lonely. They're young. So at some point you decide, you ask the general conference, how do you end up back here in America? Right. Um, we We basically came to the place where you know, transitions are hard for teenagers. I had experienced them as a pastor's kid. And my mom, being a missionary kid, had had a rough transition also in academy. Um, actually, even before that, she went to boarding school in elementary school. Um, oh. So not easy. Um, and so we just saw signs in our kids that, you know, it's time for us to go back. And we requested uh, permanent return, recognizing that, you know, we, we actually had another call, which I was prepared to take at that time, but not wanting to leave what we were doing, but just realized for the family that would be better. And uh, Adventist Mission team, Gary Kraus encouraged, and Homer Chakarton, who's my supervisor at that time, excuse me, um, they, they both said, no, we'd like you to keep doing this for a few years f from America, uh, leading the, the Buddhist ministry until... Um, until your kids are settled, and, and then you can go back. So that's what we did. What do you think was your greatest joy? The thing that, like when you think back on this time that you served in Thailand with mm -hmm. Adam's mission, that just brings you the greatest amount of joy. The greatest joy, actually, is kind of what I'm doing now even as the planning director for Adam's mission. And that was going around and visiting global mission pioneers, lay people who are planting churches, and just seeing what they're working with, um, all of a sudden, all the experiences I'd had personally in Laos, I'm now learning about them because I'm observing other people. And I'm realizing, oh, there's a pattern here. It wasn't just my experience in Laos, but this worker in Sri Lanka or in Myanmar or up in China or wherever I was traveling, they were dealing with issues and at the same time seeing how God was working. And I noticed a pattern. If you want to see miracles minister to people who are not believers in Christ because God is happy to show that he is real by answering their prayers and, and touching their life in a very personal and tangible way. And whether I, you know, we saw people sick, a person with a stroke uh, said, if God doesn't help me to walk home on Friday, I don't believe he's real. And his wife scolded him, who's already an Adventist, you can't test God like that. Well, on Friday, she looked up as she was washing dishes at her house, and there's her husband walking home from the hospital. You know, amazing stories. Um, so to me, that's the greatest joy I had in our time in Thailand is, is having the time, because that, that was our hub, but we were supporting workers all around Asia and just being able to go and hear these stories and realize that God is as real now as he has ever been.
And if we want to see more miracles, we need to be on the front lines of mission because that's where God wants to work and where he's most readily able to show his power. So you now work as planning director yes. for Adventist Mission. What does that actually mean? Because, yeah. I mean, like, first off, well, people can go back and watch Gary Krause's episode sure. so that they can find out what Adventist mission means. But there's a, you know, there's people think, oh, you guys are the ones who send missionaries. That's not at mm-hmm. all what you do. Um, you work in specifically the three areas, the 1040 region. I'm going to get this. 1040 <laughs> region, the urban centers. Mm-hmm. And Give me a hint. Post-Christian. Post-Christian. Yes, I areas, was like, yeah. I know it's, we used to call it post-modern, it's post-Christian. I remembered it was something that had changed. Yes. Um, you do a lot of church planting, um, centers of influence, all this. But in your role as mm-hmm. planning director, what does that actually mean? So basically, you know, Adventist mission has two arms. One is church planting, and that's where a global mission that name comes from. It's all the church planting side. The other side is mission awareness, which is focusing on... Uh, producing the mission spotlight and the mission quarterlies and the mission stories and the Sabbath school lessons. And also there's Mission 360 and uh, a magazine and a TV program. So these are the two arms, mission awareness and the church planting among the unreached. So my job is to supervise those who receive the donations that are come in to support the church planting work, as well as to process applications for funding from the world's divisions and also to give support to Adventist mission directors in various ways. So basically, it's uh, it, the strategy end is to also do a better job understanding who are the unreached and, and then how to, you know, how do we actually measure whether a group is reached or unreached and how do we do a better job reaching them. So that's kind of in a nutshell. So you've kind of moved to an administrative role. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask a question that hopefully your boss closes his ears for a second, potentially. While you serve in this role, do you miss being on the front lines? Oh, absolutely. That's easy. (laughs) Would you like to go back? You know what? Mission is wherever there are unreached people. So to deal with that missing of what we had, because, you know, when you go back, it's never quite the The same same. that it was. So we like to go back for visits. If God were to call, absolutely, I'd be happy to go back. Um, but right now, we're also doing mission where we are uh, with reaching out to to people. And we have a very exciting Sabbath school class in Spencerville Church. Yay, that is I also go to that for, church. <laughs> yes. So it's for new believers and people who are seeking. So um, also getting re- involved in outreach and things like that. So I feel that we are all Christians first. And then we, if we work for the church, then that just comes on second. So every every disciple of Christ has to be involved in mission, has to be involved in soul winning. So we do that here, but obviously it's a little different than how we do it over there. But uh, I get my fix of of, fix. of it by when I travel. <laughs> I travel a lot, so I'm able to be in the field and, and interact with people. In fact, can I, do you have time for one I do, little absolutely story? for you, because you're Greg. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, in December, I was traveling uh, for some meetings and I was asked to speak in a house church. And I knew that the in the house church, uh, a lot of the people were not going to be Christian. They were seekers. So I knew that I needed to, instead of teach a topical s- sermon, it needed to be a story, Bible story, with some lessons applied. And so I prayed about it, and I decided to share the story of when another foster daughter we had died when she was six. And it was a very tragic story. I don't have time to tell that. But the part I want to tell is that God impressed me that these people need to understand the good news about the state of the dead and the good news about the fact that God answers prayers even if it takes a delay before he does. A lot of miracles were happening in the city where we were at, and so they were used to seeing a lot of miracles, but I had a feeling that there were some who hadn't seen the miracle they had hoped for. What I, As I was preaching, it came to my knowledge that there was a woman who was dressed in black and her niece had just died a few days earlier. And she had come to church because she knew that even though she couldn't answer the reason, the question, why did God let that happen? 
that God had it, that she could trust God. Her family forbid her to go, didn't want her to go. They all gave up on God because God had not answered their prayer. But she realized, no, God is trustworthy. I just don't understand. So she came. And I realized I'd never preached that sermon before. I created it as special. I found out the night before I was going to be speaking. So I put it together Sabbath morning before I went to the church. And it was the exact message that that woman needed to hear that week. Wow. And that's so, just like a month ago. Yeah. And yeah, that was last month. So to so I realized that that um, mission and, you know, our life experience, it's all about partnering with God. And there's no greater joy than knowing that that right there was God working. It wasn't me. Amen. Greg, it has been so fun to sit across from you. Um, it's been across a pleasure. the table, um, drinking our water. Um <laughs> Thank you for your life of service and mission. Um, you've impacted me personally multiple times in my life. And I know that there are so many more that you have continued to reach out to, to impact their lives. Um, thank you for caring about the souls of people in the end, for allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work in you so that he could work through you. Uh, it's a there's no greater joy for sure and i've enjoyed having a lot of these last these years off and on uh walking along with you um thank you for the ministry that you do as well we hope you enjoyed this episode of AM and profiles with my special guest greg witsit if you haven't already please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast youtube channel wherever it is you're tuning in from today i don't want you to miss any future episodes Thank you for spending this time with us and join me next time as we get to know the life stories of more inspiring people.